Yesterday's show was on Tennessee and the latest college football playoff projections. Part of that, style points. And what a weekend to get some style points against the Kentucky Wildcats. All that more to Tuesday, Locked On Vols. You are Locked On Vols, your daily podcast on the Tennessee Volunteers. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, good Tuesday morning, everybody. Welcome into Locked On Vols. I'm your host, Eric Kane. Appreciate you guys for being here and making this your first listen, your first watch. You guys know it. We're free and available wherever you get your podcast. You everydayers, today's show is yours. Segments two and three, we're going to get into answering some of your mailbag questions. So stay tuned for that. Uh, Got to find out about who Kentucky is, who Tennessee versus Kentucky is, the series all time. Of course, we know it's been heavily dominated, you know, by by Tennessee, and about the opportunity that's in front of Tennessee to um, really make a state, not a statement win, but kind of get a kind of get its mojo back offensively. That's coming up here on today's show in segment number one. Again, we can't thank you guys enough for being here, making Lockdown Balls a part of your morning routine. Big shout out to FanDuel for being a part of the show today. New customers who plays a five dollar bet. And you'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. Visit FanDuel.com to go ahead and get started today. So uh, we know about Tennessee versus Kentucky. We know about you know, Tennessee in the all-time series, 84 wins, 26 losses, 9 ties. We know that Tennessee won 26 straight from 85 to 2010. We know Tennessee's won 8 of the last 10 matchups, the last loss in the series, and ironically, the first win for Kentucky in Knoxville since 1984 was back in 2020. Yeah, back in 2020, where the University of Tennessee during that COVID shortened season, the last year in a Pruitt, fell 34 to seven. We know that was a really really bad game. I remember that one um, pretty uh, pretty quick because of the two pick sixes. But the point of the matter is Tennessee's had so much success against Kentucky, and I'm not sitting here to say that you know just assume that success is going to follow on Saturday. Of course, you got to go out there and earn it, but. When you look at who Kentucky has been to this point in 2024, there's no reason to believe Tennessee can't go and win and win in convincing fashion. Uh, what Tennessee is to Florida over the course of the last, you know, decade plus has been, you know, I know that's kind of changed a little bit. Tennessee's won two of the last three. It is what Kentucky has been to, is what Kentucky's been to Tennessee, quite frankly. Just a game that you expect to win. And Saturday, you should expect to win this game. Why? Well, Kentucky is 3-5 and five overall in the season, 1-5 and five in Southeastern Conference play. Kentucky has lost three straight. Um, lost 20-13 to 13 at home against Vanderbilt. Lost 48-20 to 20 on the road at Florida. And then this past weekend, lost 24-10 to 10 at home to Auburn, where the Tigers were ran for 326 yards on that Kentucky defense, and Kentucky switched quarterbacks at halftime, went away from Brock Vandergriff and to Gavin Wimsat, I believe is how you say his name. Apologies if that's incorrect, the former Rutgers quarterback. So it's a Kentucky team that's been very, very underwhelming. Um, at, at its basis, I still think defensively it's okay. Now, I will put a caveat on all this before I get into the stats and say, I just mentioned it there. Auburn ran for 326 yards against Kentucky last week. Okay. The Hunter kid ran for like 280, which is incredible. Incredible. Um, a week ago against Florida, they allowed 197 yards on the ground, but back up tailback, back up to Montreal Johnson, who was out. Jaden Baugh ran for a career high 106 yards and Count them, one, two, three, four, five. Five touchdowns against Kentucky. So the last two weeks, the rush defense has been very, very bad. Not suspect. It's been just flat-out horrific, to be completely honest. So there's opportunity for Dylan Sampson in this run game and for Nico to build off that run game in the first half of this football game. And I think that's a key. I'll get the keys and all that stuff later on in the week. But, uh, you know, at, at the bottom line, I feel like this is an opportunity for Tennessee to get his mojo back offensively get back to scoring in the first half, allow Nico to connect on some of those deep plays, go hit a layup, as Brent Hubbs would say, because I think Tennessee's going to have the opportunity to run the football at will, okay? I know I said that going into the Florida game, and that was not the case, but I truly do believe that's going to be the case here against Kentucky. And then Nico can kind of build off that. But um, defensively overall, it's not horrible. Um, in eight games this year, they rank seventh in the Southeastern Conference, giving up an average of 310 yards per game. Tenth in the SEC in points allowed per game at 19. But 
again, I, I think there's there's a lot of good defense in the SEC this year. Um, not like it used to be in the 90s and early 2000s, but 19 points per game in this era of college football, it's not bad. But that's 10th in the league right now. Uh, Tennessee, on the other end, is giving up about 11. Um, pass defense is really good. It only allows 178 yards through the air, but rush defense is 12th, allowing 132 yards. So I think there's an outlier there because they've been pretty pretty bad against the run. They've uh, forced nine turnovers on the year. They're holding opponents to 50% in the red zone, which is pretty good in terms of touchdowns. Uh, we know NFL talent up front, J.J. Weaver, um, Deion Walker. Um, those guys are going to be playing in the NFL. Those guys are really, really good players. Uh, Octavius Oxendine is a former Tennessee recruit <laughs> from way back when. He's still there. He's a he's a force in the middle. Georgia transferred uh, Jamon Dumas Johnson. Linebacker is a really good player in the middle. De'Ara Jackson continues to be there for Kentucky. So there are some names that we're familiar with for this Kentucky defense. It's a different looking secondary. Jordan Love at the safety is leading the team in tackles. Uh, JQ Hardaway is a pretty talented cornerback with two interceptions. But the defense has not played here well lately especially against the run, so opportunities there. Offensively, it has been an absolute train wreck, an absolute train wreck, and I think Tennessee's defense should just feast on this, okay? I mentioned the quarterback change at halftime against Auburn last week. Brock Vandegrift, the former five-star quarterback, coming from Georgia to Kentucky. He has been extremely underwhelming, to say the least. Six touchdowns, five interceptions, 57% completion, 1,236 yards. It's not very good. Well, they went with Gavin Wimsat at, at the halftime break against um, against Auburn. And, you know, on the ground, he's more of a runner. He did score two touchdowns on the season, 151 yards rushing. But through the year, he's only 8 of 20 on the season, 93 yards and two interceptions. So there's not a whole lot of dynamic playmaking there from, from either quarterbacks. The run game is not very good. Uh, Jamarian Wilcox has been the lead back, 39 attempts, 245 yards, a touchdown. He does average 6.4 yards per carry, but it just... Yeah, we're so used to, you know, Ray Davis and, um, you know, before Ray Davis, it was, uh, gosh, I'm forgetting his name, but there's been some pretty talented, run Chris Rodriguez, there's been some pretty talented running backs in Kentucky the last couple of years. That has not been the case this year. Um, and, and, you know, Wilcox, the yards per carry looks pretty decent, but the whole, the entire offense just hasn't really gotten in rhythm. And, and it's, it's funny too, because at wide receiver, I think they've got some playmakers, man. Barry on Brown and Dane Key are two really good players, two really good players. Dane Key. Uh, clearly the number one target, 39 receptions, 587 yards, two touchdowns. Barry on Brown, 23 receptions, 278 yards, and three touchdowns. No other wide receiver, no other pass catcher outside of a backup tailback has 10 receptions on the year. Those are the only two guys. Um, so those are some pretty good players. It's just Kentucky's not had luck getting them the football, I guess. Um, Kentucky's going to play a lot of 12 personnel. Kentucky's going to play multiple tight ends. About three or four of those guys will play in a football game, two at a time. At times, Jordan Dingle, who was on his official visit to Tennessee via the transfer portal the same weekend Holden Stays was, and it was said, hey, whoever commits first has got the spot, and Holden Stays committed, and Jordan Dingle went back, and again, Mark Stoops said that, hey, you know, Tennessee tried to steal him, yada, yada, yada. I mentioned that on yesterday's show. It was just, you know, comical, to be honest with you. But nonetheless, Jordan Dingle is a pretty decent player, but the stats aren't showing that. Willie Rodriguez, a... Uh, uh, a freshman tight end that Tennessee had to Mitcherson. in. He plays a little bit. Kamari Anderson plays. Josh Caddis plays. An offensive line that gave up 22 sacks altogether in 2022 has given up 20 in eight games so far this year, blocking for a unit that uh, rushes for 3.8 yards per carry, which is not great, and has given up 45 TFL. So the offensive group has been an absolute train wreck. First-year offensive coordinator Bush Hammond has not been good, coming over from Boise State. Uh, opportunity, not only to win this football game, Tennessee controls its own destiny by winning out, but of course we know what looms on, on November the 16th, and we know that you can't take any Saturday for granted, okay? You got to go in there with the right mindset, and I think Tennessee will, obviously, following that upset loss on the road to Arkansas that it's continuing to rear its ugly head, but there's opportunity for style points here. And say Tennessee finishes the regular season 10-2. I'm not saying that should be the expectation. Tennessee can certainly beat Georgia. But say Tennessee does fall at some point, finishes the regular season 10-2. You're going to be, you, you, you want to have a great resume. You want to have style points. You want to give the committee every single reason to prove that you're one of the best 12 or really 11 teams in the country. Okay, because I'm not taking group of five into consideration here. And style points would help. And I think there's opportunity for style points here because 
this Kentucky team is just so bad. So didn't say it's going to be easy. It should be easy, but sometimes it's never easy, especially against a rival. Hey, when we come back, we'll get into your mailbag questions, all that and more as we continue on here with the Monday morning edition or Tuesday morning edition of Locked on Balls. Hey, Tennessee fans, it's time to recognize the Roy Player of the Week. So far this season, we pulled over 20,000 to support players on Roy. Micro deposits lead to massive change. With Roy App, you can direct your support to student-athletes that you love, ensuring that all the funds go to the specific player that you choose. Unlike collectives, you know exactly where your support is going, and you even receive exclusive content like personal videos and updates after the season. The best part, it's risk-free. If the athlete transfers or doesn't deliver on the content, you get your money back. So I know it's a bye week. But this week, I'm going to support Cooper Mays. I pitched in $100, and I love for you to join me. Even $10 makes a difference. Let's show Cooper Mays the love and keep him connected to our school. Remember, pay today, celebrate tomorrow. Your support sets the team up for success. Plus, don't miss out on Roy's exciting giveaway. Win two tickets to a game in November. Just download Roy, create an account, put in the referral code Locked On, and uh, when you enter, and you're entered. Already on Roy, any contribution to an athlete's campaign also gets you entered automatically. No purchase necessary, void where prohibited. Download Roy and join the NIL game with no subscription, no fees. And be sure to check us out on Instagram, Facebook, and X at Roy underscore return on you for more info. Roy, support the players, change the game. Okay, you everydayers, it is your time to shine. Questions, comments, concerns, always voice at underscore Kaner at Lockdown Balls on the YouTube channel. Um, every Tuesday, I try to take a segment or two to answer these and do the best of my abilities. I'm not going to lie to you. Sometimes I don't know all the answers, but um, let's go ahead and get started. We'll start with on the YouTube channel. We'll go to Dakota. Uh, do you think the second half of the Alabama game boosted the offense's confidence, and will we see improvements or something new this week? And with Samson possibly being beat up, do you think they will give some of the workload to Bishop? Thanks so much, GBO. We are Kentucky's daddy. <laughs> um, as far as the confidence, I mean, you should have confidence. Nico should have left that game feeling good about himself, knowing that he struggled, knowing that the offense overall obviously struggled. It was far from perfect. He made plenty of mistakes, but you made big boy plays to go and win a big boy football game. That's why you come to the University of Tennessee. That's why Tennessee made him the absolute priority in that quarterback heavy draft uh, prospect class, recruiting class. There we go. Um, that's why Tennessee wanted Nico, and Nico delivered in that game. Now, again, I'm saying I'm not saying that he's arrived. Far from perfect. Needs to continue to grow. Needs to stop making silly redshirt freshman mistakes, first year starter mistakes. Needs to connect on passes deep down the field. His receivers need to help him with that. But if I'm Nico, I'm leaving that game confident because I made two really good throws. I made two really, really good throws that helped Tennessee win that football game. And so, yeah, I, I would I would have some confidence there. Plus, the run game was was awesome in the second half. Now, can you do it for four quarters? As far as Dylan Sampson, um, yeah, I, I think it's – I mean, he's clearly going to be RB1. But I think it's more or less like he doesn't need to have 26 attempts, 27 attempts like he's had the last two games against Alabama and Florida. There needs to be a, maybe a, a 17, 18 to, to, to 9 or 10 split, in, in my opinion. Um, let's go to Darren. Do you think Mike Matthews sees the field? If so, um, does he ball out or does he have an average game? You know, until I see Mike Matthews play a big role for this offense, I'm going to say no. I don't believe that Mike Matthews is going to play. Now, he played five snaps against Alabama. He played, I want to say, nine snaps against Florida. It's not like he's not seeing the field at all, but clearly he's not been a big focal point in this offense. I'll have another question on Mike Matthews here in a moment. Um, let's go to Devin. Do you have any insight on if they've been working Mike Matthews in the slot last week? Uh, and this week heading into Kentucky. Yeah, I talked about that a lot last week on how I would have liked to have seen them rep him in nothing but the slot. Um, I've not heard that to that to be the case. I'm not saying it hadn't happened, but I just haven't heard. I haven't talked to uh, people over there since last week, so I'll try to check on that But um, in, in terms of that. Uh, but that's what I would do. Um, but at, at the basis of it, you just want to get Mike comfortable and um, having a lot of confidence in himself wherever he's lined up. And um, I think they should rep him in the slot, but that's just me. Uh, to answer your question, no, I, I don't know if that was the plan over the bye week. Um, TNJRCFL1 says, do we go 12, 12 personnel, and have we worked out wrinkles to combat the 3-5 defensive uh, scheme thrown against us? Yeah, I mean, they work against a three-man front all the time. Even going into the Arkansas game, they had worked a three-man front. They weren't expecting Arkansas to run that, 
but it's not like it was completely new. I mean, Missouri runs that against Tennessee each of the last three years. Um, Pittsburgh ran that against Tennessee. Um, NC State ran that against Tennessee. So it's not a foreign concept, okay? <laughs> They're not reinventing the wheel here. Um, it's just they weren't expecting that from Arkansas, and they had to adjust on the fly. Obviously, the adjustments weren't good. Um, as far as 12 personnel, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think Tennessee's ran 12 personnel every single game since we first saw it against NC State. Now, it, it's been a, a bigger part of the game plan in some games. Clearly, against NC State, it was to combat that three-man front. Um, sometimes we've just seen it here for a series or two. But, yeah, I think that's a wrinkle that Tennessee will continue to run out there with. And I think they like Holden Stays, and I think they like Miles Kitzelman um, kind of in that grouping of 12 personnel. I appreciate you guys sending in questions on the YouTube channel. Let's quickly go before a break. Uh, let's go over and check the – let's check my um, uh, bookmarks. Here we go, bookmarks. Let's go to Jared here. Jared says, do you think – a lot of Mike Matthews here. <laughs> do you think a reason why Matthews hasn't played much is due to the seniority in the room and not for a lack of understanding? Does Pope hype want to let the vets get their snaps because they put in time and they don't want to ruffle any feathers? Can't recall them benching a vet for a fresh. Um, so at the end of the day, your job as a coach is to play the best player that's going to give you the best chance to win. Okay. I don't think that they're playing quote unquote favorites by allowing veterans veterans to play. I think it goes down to trust. We saw Jalen McCullough, who by the way is balling out in the NFL. We saw Jalen McCullough and Trayvon Flowers play every snap of every football game. We saw Jalen McCullough and Wesley Walker. We saw Jalen McCullough and whatever combination of safety he was back there with play the majority of the snaps. Why? Because Tim Banks trusted them the most. We've seen Tennessee play Brew McCoy and Squirrel White, even Squirrel when he's been banged up, so much because Tennessee's coaches trust them the most. And, I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. I like Brew, and obviously I like Squirrel too. But as I said last week, when Squirrel White is – banged up and and I, I I admire his grit and determination and and there's another question about that here in a moment um I admire it but I mean if you're if you're if you're not healthy get out of the football game and that's on the player that's on the coach in my opinion so uh, I guess in a long way of saying do they play quote unquote favorites of the vets no but I do think they play the players that they trust the most and sometimes I think that gets in the way of seeing true potential sometimes you just got to shove a guy out there and, and say sink or swim and you know, I think we're not getting a, we're not getting to see a lot of those opportunities for some young guys at points in times. Now, give the defensive staff their due, man. They have rotated four safeties all year long, and that's awesome, and that's great. And and you know, Tennessee fans have been you know beating the drum trying to have that happen for for a long time. Um, also, I I don't think for Mike Matthews, it's I don't think it's a lack of understanding. I just think it's a I think it's a for for Matthews. I think right now, at least I've been told. You know, it's it's you gotta be consistent. Okay. You gotta be consistent in your habits and practice. You gotta be consistent with what you do when you get in the football game. Even Josh Heupel kind of said that when somebody asked about Mike Matthews on Monday, saying there's there's greater opportunity for success when you're in the football game. Now it's up for you to go find that success. Um, or, you know, sometimes your teammates have got to, you know, step up for you as well. So I think a lot of that has to do with that. I I want to see Mike Matthews play. I think he um, is, is a better option at points in times with, with some of the receivers that are bit banged up. But um, I think it starts for Mike and really for anybody to do it consistently and earn it before the field. And, um, you know, he's still a young guy. I just I know it's tough when you see a guy like Ryan Williams doing what he's doing. I understand that's tough. I get it. Um, so here's to hoping that we see more Mike Matthews down the stretch because I think he can help this team. Um, when we come back, I've got plenty more questions to get into right here on your X Tuesday mailbag edition of the show. This is Locked On Balls. I want to tell you guys about my friends over at FanDuel Sportsbook. Get ready to tackle the NFL action with FanDuel. It's America's number one sports bug because right now new customers can bet $5, $5 and get $150 in bonus bets if you win. Uh, the FanDuel Sportsbook app gives you everything you need to place live bets on the NFL all in one place. So when you get a hunch in the middle of a game, you can check out the latest stats, view the live play-by-play, -play, and so much more, all on the same page where you place your bets. Just visit FanDuel.com to join today. You'll get started with $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. That's at FanDuel.com. Again, $150 in bonus bets if you win your first $5 bet. 
FanDuel.com. Never waste a hunch and make every moment more with FanDuel, an official sportsbook partner of the NFL. FanDuel, it is where you can make every moment more. Okay, guys and gals, we got a final segment left here this Tuesday edition of Locked On Balls. I am Eric Kane. You guys know it, free and available wherever you get your podcast. Tell your friends, tell your family members about Locked On Balls. It is a great way to start your morning routine on the way to work. Maybe you're in the gym, maybe you're in that cubicle pretending you're working. Whatever that is, it's your number one stop for news and information, entertainment, hopefully, um, weekday mornings right here. Really, year-round, but you guys know it. You guys care about football season for sure. All right, let's go to the Orange Kool-Aid. Orange Kool-Aid, uh, love the handle, okay, love the picture. Um, at this point in the recruiting calendar, can Tennessee still land a top-five class? I, I don't think so. Um, let me pull up the, uh, the uh, recruiting class team rankings right now. For Tennessee over at on three, Tennessee's eighth nationally, sixth in the SEC, and twenty uh, Tennessee has twenty three commits. Um, they're still in on a couple of different guys, trying to you know finish off this class. Obviously, still trying to play keep away, trying to you know stiff arm the competition. Jaden Harmon uh, reaffirmed his commitment, said, "Hey, I'm done. This is where I'm going to be after the Tennessee Alabama game. That was huge." Georgia continues to come after linebacker Christian Gass, and Tennessee's got to play keep away there in a big way. Auburn, you know, has continued to come after Travis Smith and and so on and so forth. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do not think that Tennessee will have a top five class to answer your question, but I still think this is a really, really solid class. Top 10 class is something to celebrate. Uh, 23 commits as well. That's, that, that's really, really good. Uh, appreciate your question, Orange Kool-Aid man. Let's go to Rob. Two for Twitter Tuesday. First, give us a report on the base vols performance against Troy. Yeah, I, I gave a I gave a uh, update because I was there in Nashville on Monday's show. Um, obviously wasn't at the game in Troy on Sunday, but uh, did get a couple of notes. Um, really from the first nine innings because um after the nine innings, what would have been a normal game, uh, they, they they kind of took a short little break had a whole new lineup, you know, subs, all that in there. But um, anyway, um, you know, Jay Abernathy, DH, uh, I tweeted out the lineup before the game on Sunday. Jay Abernathy, the true freshman, uh, he DH led off, had a couple steals, I was told, had a couple of hits. I, I think he's going to play a role for this team. I'll be intrigued to see kind of how they work him in. Um, Dean Curley had a couple hits, I was told. Um, Andrew Fisher, the Ole Miss transfer, had a two-run double, I believe, um, if my notes notes say that correctly. Um, I think, uh, Colby Backus had a better day than he did in, in Nashville. Not that he played poorly in Nashville, but I think he had a couple hits in Jackson. Uh, Nate Snead looked good. He started the game, went two innings. Brandon Arvidsson's a guy that I think, uh, Tennessee fans are going to love from the junior college ranks. He, he came on and pitched an inning. Tegan Coons, who very well could be a weekend starter, looked good. Uh, Tennessee won that first, you know, nine innings, six to three, and then won the day, I believe 14 to six overall. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll get to see Tennessee, not, not at Lindsey Nelson, but they'll play in a fall world series uh, here in a couple weeks as well. So Tennessee baseball, good weekend overall productive weekend for sure. Uh, number two from Rob, he says, let's hear how you would rank the remaining opponents in order of difficulty to get a win. He said, mine is Georgia, Vandy, Mississippi state, UK, and UTEP. Uh, mine would be, Yeah. Yeah, I think that's I think that's how I'd be. I, number one's at Georgia. Number two is probably on the road at Vanderbilt, but that should be a should be a home game because Tennessee fans will very much outnumber the Commodore fans just because of what um, Diego Pavia can do. Um, he, he's so dynamic at the quarterback position; can hurt you with his legs. Um, I think he presents some challenges for sure, and so because of that dynamic playmaking ability at quarterback, I too would have Vanderbilt second. Mississippi State is going to be third because Mississippi State can score. And what does Tennessee not do well right now? Score. And so until that is, you know, rectified a little bit, I'll, I'll say that's not not overwhelmingly alarming, but because their defense is atrocious, their defense is so bad, um, but Mississippi State can at least score, so I'll have them at three. I would have Kentucky up there with Georgia, but 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 Kentucky's just been so bad lately. This I mean it's been h- horrible. Tennessee, what an opportunity to really kind of you know put them out of its misery essentially. Um, I'd have Kentucky fourth, and then obviously UTF. Fast. So I would agree with you, Rob. I think that's kind of the order that I would have for the final five games. Appreciate you as always, Roba twenty two, and I appreciate you on VolQuest. Uh, Mark said, "Love to talk about Squirrels grit and repping Matthews in the slot last week. Knowing Nimrod isn't a slot either. My question is." 
who have we recruited to play the slot? We Do we recruit specifically for the slot? Can't imagine Squirrel being only option to start the season. Um, no, Nimrod Nimrod was his backup to begin the season. I guess my point is, like, they, they, they transformed Nimrod over time to play the slot. Like, he was more of an outside guy his first year here, and he's been repping as, as an option in the slot the last couple of years. Um, Braylon Staley can play the slot. Okay, I think Mike Matthews can play. You you recruit a like like an offensive lineman, or like a defensive lineman, sometimes like a secondary guy. You want to be able to have a guy that can do multiple stuff. Now, when you get to a college, you want to channel in on one specific thing. So, um, you know, I think Mike Matthews was recruited, signed, knowing he could do both, but they focus him on the outside. Braylon Staley was focused, or you know, was was recruited, signed attended college knowing that like, Hey, I could do both, but I'm, I'm more of a slot. So Braylon Staley, Staley would be the answer right there. Um, let's go to Patriots Wade. I was right there with you Saturday evening at a wedding reception in Clarksville with my beer and a phone propped up. Yes, sir. Hey, that is the way to do it. No disrespect. In fact, I was told the wedding I attended, um, it was my wife's friend. She got married and I wish them all the success and happiness is a beautiful wedding, but I was told that the groom watches the show sometimes. So, Hey, if you're watching, I'll leave your name out. I had a wonderful time. I did have my phone up watching football and I'm sure you, uh, I'm sure you, you know, d didn't mind, <laughs> but if you're going to have a wedding in the fall, expect dudes like us, we're going to have phones out. We're going to be watching football. Uh, it was still a really, really good time. Had a really great time Saturday night. Um, NBA ball boy says, obviously this game, should be heavily in the Vols' favor, but what problems matchups favor Kentucky, if any? Uh, I mean, Tennessee's Tennessee honestly is favored, and I mean, I guess according to stats, you would say Kentucky's secondary greater than Tennessee's passing game, but I don't really believe it at this point in the week. I think Tennessee has been Tennessee's biggest um, adversary in that regard. Um, I do recognize J.J. Weaver is a good player. I do recognize Deion Walker is a great player. I do recognize there are some dudes on that front seven, okay? Um, I still think Tennessee's run game is going to be fine, but that that front seven for Kentucky w is what would give me some concern. However, again, guys, health's a big thing. J.J. Weaver's got to be healthy. Walker's got to be healthy for them. Look what Auburn did to them last year, 326 yards on the ground. So, again, like that would be my concerning thing to point to, but look what Auburn did, look what Florida did. No reason that Dylan Sampson and Tennessee can't do that. Austin Rogers says, how are we feeling about Georgia? The defense is obviously not as good as it's been in the last couple of years, but we can run the ball like we have been. And it, But can we run the ball like we have been? Is Nico developing enough to beat Georgia on the road? Um, Yeah, can Tennessee beat Georgia? Absolutely. Can Tennessee run the ball against Georgia like it has the last couple of weeks? Well, I would have liked to have seen Tennessee run the ball well in the first half, and that's not been the case the last couple of weeks. Has Nico is Nico developing enough to be Georgia on the road? Right now, I would say no. That does not mean that can be the case in a couple of weeks. I'm not saying there's any reason to to, to have overwhelming concern about Nico. I just think he's a young quarterback making young mistakes and. You got to hit on some of those deep balls, some of those layups. You, you got to hit on some of those. And again, that's not all on Nico. That's, uh, you know, on the receivers as well. Um, so at this point, I would say no, but that doesn't mean that can be the case in a couple of weeks. Okay. I Tennessee's offense is so close. And that's why you, as a Tennessee fan, you should be so freaking pumped up knowing how good your defense is and how close you are offensively to truly exploding and being a big team. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think Georgia is very beatable. Will Tennessee win on the road at Georgia? I don't know. We'll see. Tennessee struggled on the road at points in times. Um, well, I'll, I'll have a better feel of exactly who Georgia is on that game week, but certainly a, a game Tennessee can win. Um, let's see here. Glock Vols. If the Vols, if the offense doesn't get going in these next two games, do you think we will be on the outside looking in purely due to style points based off? Uh, both of both us, LSU, Texas A and M are all ten and two. If Tennessee A and M and LSU are all ten and two, that's going to be intriguing. Well, A and M owns the tiebreaker over LSU. Tennessee hasn't played LSU or A and M. If it's Tennessee, Alabama, or A and M, all ten and two, Tennessee owns the tiebreaker over Alabama, but A and M's got the better resume. See, these are big time question marks. But to your point, style points, you need to give the committee every single reason to say Tennessee's got to be it. Tennessee's got to be it. Tennessee's got to be it. So. Yeah, I think style points are a big issue or a big thing, and Tennessee's defense got to continue on. 
Uh, Kurt says, rank the theme slash jerseys for Tennessee in terms of your favorite or that you think is the coolest. I love this question. Dark mode, checker kneeling, orange out, smoky grays. Um, okay, here we go. Number one. And uh, – <laughs> nobody's ever going to, we, we pull 10 people, we'll probably get 10 different combinations or variations. Right. And here's mine. Hate all you want. I said it on, um, on talking balls, Boogie Bentley show Monday morning. Hey, I am a sucker for checker Nealon. I love checker Nealon. I think it's so beautiful. I think it's beautiful. I think it's gorgeous. Give me checker Nealon. Number one, number two, give me dark mode. I think those look sick. Number three, give me smoky gray. Number four, the orange out. I mean, uh, I mean, if, if you're doing an orange out, do an or, do an orange pants too. In my opinion, that's kind of what I do there. Appreciate you as always, Kurt. Got a couple more. Uh, let's go into it. A, a couple of minutes left here on this show. Um, <clears throat> Allen says, "When we beat Bama in 2022, Jalen Hyde had the game of his life. His five touchdown performance was the exclamation point on the Blitnikoff Award-winning performance." Simul- similarly, words. Who had their career-defining performances moment in the Bama game this year? Not necessarily for an award-winning performance. Um, defining? Will Brooks. He had two plays. game ceiling interception, shoestring tackle. Both of those magnificent, huge games. Huge plays in that football game. Nico's two throws. I thought those were huge. Um, I thought Dylan Sampson had some moments, but immediately when I read this, I thought of Will Brooks. Take it or leave it. Uh, additional question, in your personal opinion, right now, who gets drafted from our squad? Oh, my gosh. I'd have to sit here and try to think about who's draft eligible. But just working down the offensive line, I think eventually, I think Cooper Mays is drafted. I think um, Spragans will be have an opportunity. See, there's a difference in being drafted or get, getting into a camp. But I think Cooper Mays will be drafted. Samson will be drafted. Nico eventually will be drafted. I think Brew will be drafted. I think Braz will be drafted. We'll see about Thornton. Mike Matthews will be drafted eventually. Um, James Pierce will be drafted. Gosh, Dominic uh, Omar Norman Lott probably will be drafted. Aaron Carter will probably be drafted eventually. Jermon McCoy will be drafted. Ricky Gibson will be drafted. Not all this year. Keep in mind, not all this year. Um, Boo Carter's got a good chance to be drafted. Again, a lot of these players got to continue on, but eventually I think all those guys, and I know I'm missing some, I apologize, but... Um, there you go. Uh, for Twitter Tuesday, what year does the restriction and penalties lift off Tennessee? I can't remember. Okay. Good, good question. I'll look this up, uh, just to double check. Um, Tennessee was, was hit with $8 million fine, five years of probation, a reduction to 28 scholarships. Um, Pruitt received a six year show cause. So Tennessee, so the five-year show cause, so 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, will be done in 20, no, excuse me, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, will be done after 2027. Um, so 2027, after that season, or after that year, is, is what you're looking at. And heading into the 2023 season, Tennessee still had 10 more, or this year, including this year, Tennessee still has 10 more um, well, I guess eight more if you include this year. Ten more scholarships that they have to reduce here in the probation period. So uh, there you go there. Um, and we got two more. Gonna 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 be quick on this. My buddy Colin says thoughts on the basketball exhibition. Um, yeah, again, I didn't get to watch it because I wasn't there. It wasn't televised. I didn't listen to it because I had things going on Sunday. But from uh, checking out the box score, talking with some people, I think Felix Apara was. Pretty cool. Um, I think that he's going to add something offensively that we didn't really even think that he was going to. I, don't, I wouldn't overreact about Chaz Lanier. Obviously, his job is to shoot the basketball and make the basketball in the basket. That did not happen for him. I know he didn't play the last seven minutes. I wouldn't overreact about that. Tennessee overall just didn't shoot well. We've seen several games where Tennessee doesn't shoot well. Um, I think um, Tennessee's got some depth on the rim. I think Tennessee's got some depth on the on the wing. I think Tennessee's deeper than it was last year. I do. Um, obviously defensively, it was a pretty solid game, but offensively, not in the second half, Indiana shot 50% from the field in the second half. That can't happen, but overall don't overreact working through some, some really good issues there in that exhibition. It gets a quality team and a game that went down to the wire. I thought it was really, really, really good work. Last one goes to Polly. 
I was watching Michigan struggle to hang on against a bad Mich. I was watching, yeah, Mich. Mi- yeah, let's start over. I was watching Michigan. I was watching Michigan struggle to hang on against a bad Michigan State team, and it got me thinking: Why in the world did Brian John Marie decide to leave? He built up the room from about 1.5 legit SEC guys to one of the best defensive units on the team. The writing was on the wall that this Michigan team was going to take significant step back from last year. Was it money? Was it location? It's a little bit of both, man. I think Brian John Murray liked it here at Tennessee. I think he gave Tennessee an opportunity to keep him. But yeah, Michigan made a, a, a really nice offer, and it might have gone back and forth a couple of times. I think Tennessee might have countered once. But yeah, money was a big deal. I mean, it's life-changing money um, for him and his family. Uh, Michigan is compensating him very well. I'm sure that's public somewhere. We can look it up, but they're compensating him very well. He had been there before. He had had relationships at the University of Michigan. He's recruited that area before. There's a lot of ties there. He's coaching with some guys that he's coached with before. I think a lot of that stuff kind of played play, played a factor into um, into why he wanted to leave. So uh, that's how I'd answer that. Hey, guys, appreciate you as always. Thanks so much for... Uh, sending in questions, comments, concerns every single week. We do this thing called X Tuesday Mailbag Edition of the show right here on Locked On Balls. Uh, we'll have Josh Ward tomorrow. We'll continue to look into Tennessee and Kentucky. All that and more right here on Locked On Balls. Until then, stay safe, everybody.